Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today we are going to explore phenomenology and science. My guest, Jacob W. Glazer, represents an exciting new generation of scholars. He is an adjunct professor in the Department of Positive Human Development and Social Change at Life University USA in Marietta, Georgia where they train chiropractors, and he is also an online adjunct professor in the Department of Applied Psychology at New York University Steinhardt, which is in New York City. He is the author of the of Arts and Subjectivity, a New Animism, for the post-media era. He has a background in parapsychology, I'm proud to say. He received his doctorate in psychology, consciousness, and society from the University of West Georgia, one of the few colleges in the United States that actually offers an emphasis for graduate students in parapsychology. This is an internet interview and now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Jacob. It's a pleasure to be with you. It's a pleasure to be with you, Jeffrey. We're going to be exploring concepts that uh, I think some of our viewers are unfamiliar with. I haven't yet done a uh, an interview about phenomenology, uh, which is a very important movement uh, within philosophy. So why do, why don't we begin by providing a little context in terms of uh, the history of phenomenology in philosophy? Sure. So. Phenomenology uh, is a relatively uh, recent um, kind of uh, offshoot of traditional philosophy. Really, it was, um, I suppose, inaugurated uh, by Edmund Husserl um, in uh, the continent in Europe um, as a way to kind of look at human, the human life world. And what I mean by that is distinct from science, where science tries to look at the natural world, Husserl really wanted to investigate human psychology, and not not in the way that we today understand psychology, through the lens of science, for example, but uh, philosophically. And what that means for Husserl, and later we'll see Heidegger, uh, Husserl's student, a uh, very famous philosopher, Martin Heidegger. Um, but what that means for Husserl and for the human sciences is that we apply a rigorous methodology to look at human experience. And we don't, co you know, what I think is a mistake a lot of times in uh, maybe current science, let's say, let or the term legendary science is often used in science studies, is that we apply the methods that we use to analyze the natural world to our psychology. And I think Hosterl was really trying to um, get away from that. I think, I think one, one of the, the points, points that you, you make is, is it's, it's not, not even, even only, only just, just the natural, natural world, world, it's the inorganic natural world, world has become, become sort, sort of, of the model, model for all science. science. Indeed. Indeed. And, uh, you know, there's certain researchers in the field, for example, in parapsychology, um, that, that really advocate for applying, uh, natural scientific models and what's even more interesting metaphors, um, for example, out of quantum theory, um, to our understanding of human psychology and more specifically to psi. And I think that is, uh, really, it's a mistake in a lot of ways. Um, because as I argue in, um, in my paper, uh, that, you know, we can use these different metaphors that come out of phenomenology, such as intentionality, such as aboutness, uh, for Heidegger, ready to handedness, present to handedness, uh, 
to look at the way that human being, or what Heidegger calls Dasein, the way that the human being comes to the world. And we don't, we don't need, you know, we don't need to apply physics to understanding human psychology. And in fact, there's so, there's a lot of ethical consequences, um, I would argue that come along with, um, making that application. You also point out that, uh, legendary science, as, as you call it, it's a, not a term I'm familiar with, but I kind of like it. Uh, science as, as it's been handed down to us, uh, comes with a lot of cultural baggage. Uh, the, the guardians of the scientific community, uh, for example, tend to be, uh, you use a, a, an interesting word I just learned, cisgender white males. <laughs> Certainly. Uh, certainly, that is, you know, that, that's one argument. Um, you know, I think that the foray into what that would be called identity politics is a little bit of, um, a straw man in a certain way. Um, nonetheless, though, I think, you know, for example, another, uh, philosopher that follows this heritage of phenomenology from Edmund Husserl to Martin Heidegger, leaving Germany, going into France, we see the French post-structuralist school. Um, that um, is kind of spearheaded in a way by Michel Foucault. And Michel Foucault, while more of a historian than a philosopher, nonetheless, I think, makes very incisive arguments with regard to the way that power and knowledge get systematically um, dispersed in the way that they function generationally through social institutions. And, um, you're right. Uh, you're right, Jeff, to point out the fact that, uh, truth, right? Whatever that is, you know, call it scientific truth, um, psychological truth, whatever, whatever, you know, that, that, um, that word means, um, is all, is for Foucault at least, and for many other thinkers, is arbitrated by a very specific tradition. And that tradition, um, is typically Western in a lot of ways. It comes from the Enlightenment um, that um, hands over these values to us, um, like universal human fraternity, which sounds good, but nonetheless, it also brings with it certain ethical and practical implications that we need to think through. Um, not only that, but the view of time the Enlightenment espoused um, is very teleological in nature which means that there's certain technological progress is to be celebrated. And, you know, I would, you know, to, 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 to segue out of a kind of philosophical discourse, I mean, one need only look around at the planet to see the way that technology has wreaked havoc on um, our ecosystems. And I think that, um, you know, we need to really, there's been a recent return to enlightenment thought by thinkers like Steven Pinker, Jordan Peterson, and so on and so forth. And I think we need to be really cautious about that um, because I think that um, we haven't really thought through this kind of, these kinds of values and methodologies that were handed down to us um, specifically through the enlightenment. Well, and in terms of parapsychology as a science, there, there is a paradox that you point out in, in your paper on phenomenology and, uh, as, as a phenomenological analysis of parapsychology and the philosophy of science uh, assumed by parapsychologists, which is that naturalism, which comes out of the Enlightenment, is, is a philosophy that, uh, many adherents say that, uh, simply rules out automatically without any need for further consideration, things that they would consider supernatural. And the reports of parapsychology, they say, are um, examples of supernatural thinking and therefore don't even need to be considered at all. Absolutely. Absolutely. And not, not only is it on the level of the method that paranormality is ruled out, but to return to uh, a, a Foucauldian analysis, it would be the social structures and institutions that have, you know, somewhat covertly, or I suppose we could say unconsciously, 
to borrow a term of psychoanalysis, have stamped out any notion of what, you know, one might call wonder, um, you know, the, the strangeness of the world. Um, uh, Gra- Graham Harmon uses, uh, he has a recent monograph on Lovecraft where he talks about weird realism. Um, and that's this kind of sense of the world that the world is, is strange in a lot of ways. And not only that, but it eludes science necessarily eludes science, perhaps in order to frustrate, um, you know, if you, if we want to talk more agentially. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I think you're right. I think that, um, not only is there a, a category error with regard to the method that we're using, um, but also I think we're, we're, we, science, um, doesn't understand the world right. And that lens is handed over to us through institutions like the school, um, the, the internet, so on and so forth. One of the points that you make, I, I think if I understand you correctly, is that if we want to have an accurate phenomenological understanding of uh, what it means to be human, what it means to be a, uh, a, a subject, uh, a percipient of in the world, uh, that we have to include all of these fringe areas, uh, the fringe sciences and, and marginalized aspects of culture. You know, Foucault advocated for excavating what he called indigenous knowledges. And so those outside of the normative discourse, these kind of stories or ways of being, um, ways of becoming that circulate maybe in more minoritarian communities um, around the world, more perhaps even more indigenous communities, and looking at these practices and beliefs and not only just analyzing from a Western scientific, um, Eurocentric perspective, but really almost, I suppose, phenomenologically taking them at face value and then believing them in a, well, in a lot of ways, right? But there's that, that, um, art in phenomenology, what Husserl called the epoche. And what that means is that you hold your object object of analysis um, in be- in belief in some sense, while also trying to bracket your presuppositions and what that means, the beliefs that you might have about that object or about the world. Um, and I think that, you know, that is a much more generous uh, approach uh, to science than I think what um, a lot of the physicalists or experiment- experimentalists want to do. You point out that uh, William James, who is considered the father of American psychology, and I think by many people, one of the founders of the discipline of psychical research, which eventually led to parapsychology, uh, was basically a phenomenologist himself. Certainly, certainly. I, I, you know, I, I would argue, uh, you know, that his writing is, is in league with a certain phenomenological flavor. Um, in terms of his, his being very descriptive. And so, you know, phenomenology celebrates a descriptive mode of understanding and of uncovering truth. And, you know, if you read um, any of his works, you know, you'll get that, that sense from him that, you know, he sought to describe the world, um, again, without these kind of presuppositions or a priori uh beliefs about the world. And, you know, I I think there's a strong argument to be made that, um, you know, William James is certainly um, in the tradition of phenomenology. I'm under the impression if we try to compare phenomenology with uh, traditional science or legendary science, as you call it, uh, the scientific model suggests that there are underlying mechanisms, uh, molecules and forces. And if we want to understand the human world, we really have to understand these underlying mechanisms, whereas phenomenology suggests we can take it as we experience it. We don't have to look for underlying mechanisms. The, the raw experience is important enough. Indeed. And, you know, part of that, um, that notion of these underlying mechanisms, I think, is the danger. And one could even perhaps um, to go out a li- on a limb here and say the ethical danger 
that science brings to bear on the human condition. And what and legendary science is what I is is what I mean by that, or you know, there's different ways to talk about it, physicalism, experimentalism, and so on and so forth. But you know, it, this brings to mind Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche, who's a uh in I would argue in the tradition of phenomenology in a certain spirit. Certainly Martin Heidegger would 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 agree with that. But nonetheless, you know, Frederick Nietzsche would call these things that Jeff, like you said, these molecules. He would call them useful fictions. And so what I think he meant by that is that certainly there's a pragmatic element to them in terms of binding certain institutions together, um, gluing, keeping solidified certain um, sociological groups, uh, you know, scientific communities, for example. But nonetheless, they're fictions, nonetheless, they're fictions at the end of the day. And um, to extrapolate that a little bit, I think he was trying to cache these kind of um, useful fictions in a historical perspective. And so we could look at the ancient Greeks, for example. Um, certainly they didn't have the same useful fictions that we have today in terms of, um, you know, quantum theory. Um, so truth changes, and it changes not only historically, but it changes sociologically. And so I wonder, you know, I think as parapsychologists and even researchers or scientists, you know, we have to ask ourselves, is it ethical to apply the same method, not only historically, but also across different cultures? And you know, while I think in some ways that's a rhetorical question, because, you know, my answer is going to be no, um, you know, nonetheless, we need to think about, I think, the kind of ethical consequences that come along with with um, doing that. In your book, uh, The Arts of Subjectivity, I, I think one of the points that you're making is, is that there are many other ways to explore what we call the paranormal besides the scientific method. You, you mentioned artists and, and, uh, writers of fiction have, have been exploring it for generations and that, uh, many of their insights are, are probably, uh, deeper, more profound than we are able to achieve from the scientific method. In fact, the scientific method, when applied to, uh, paranormal Paranormal phenomenon seems to to give us very shallow results. I think that you know to return to this phenomenological spirit of being descriptive, or we could even say um, auto ethnographic. So doing an auto ethnography, describing one's inner experience, one's subjective state. Um, artists, as you suggest, Jeff, are much more talented <laughs> at being descriptive and and providing the language, right? Because uh, this is another issue that, you know, we could spend a substantial amount of time talking about is there's a dearth of language in science that doesn't get at the world. And what artists have that scientists don't is this, what Heidegger would call um, kind of poetic quality. Um, you know, Heidegger's famous for celebrating the German poet Holderlin. Um, and the way that this kind of poetic understanding of the world, or maybe more precisely description of the world, captures something more profound that our experiments and our double-blind analyses and our methodologies simply by nature cannot capture. It strikes me also that uh, one of the fundamental points that you're making is is that because we've inherited this situation where the the scientific method seems to have a um, a privileged status in our culture, uh, it it impoverishes. It, it, impoverishes us with regard to understanding ourselves. Yes, and more or more strongly, not only does it impoverish us for understanding ourselves, it 
if if we want to return to kind of a, a, a central argument of my book, the arts of subjectivity, it, it necessarily stamps out specific kinds of subjectivities. And in other words, it, it it's science in league with you know other social institutions, um, political institutions, um, uh, media. I spend a lot of time talking about the media and the way that the media creates identity. Um, it's, I think it's a, a much stronger sense that um, a lot of times we don't even know that, um, you know, we're being kind of crafted or created in this way. Um, and so, you know, I think there's a lot, at least my research program, you know, I, I'm in the lane that there's a lot of work that needs to be done in terms of really unpacking the way that all of these different social structures go into not only creating the way that we, that we see the world, um, but actually, in some sense, creating our, you know, our experience of the world, the way that we come to the world. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, science reduces down the human in a lot of ways um, to, you know, one kind of, um, exchangeable part among others. And I think that, um, you know, we see that, uh, for example, um, in things like, um, genocide or like the Holocaust, um, the way that our, our modern worldview, um, is inflicted, um, ethically in, in different ways. When we come to the uh, field of parapsychology, uh, an area that I feel passionately about and an area that's part of your background as well. There, there's something quite extraordinary, which is now we have 150 years of, of data in parapsychology, largely based on the uh, traditional scientific model and uh, the legendary scientific model, as you call it. And uh, I know it's been about not quite two years since the American Psychological Association in their flagship journal published an article uh, summarizing the results of about 1,400 different parapsychology experiments with overwhelmingly positive results. And yet, recently, I see in Psychology Today magazine, they had a debate between a proponent and, uh, and a yes, so-called skeptic of uh, the paranormal. And this skeptic had the audacity to say, and Psychology Today published it without any uh, critical uh, analysis whatsoever, that there isn't a shred of evidence for parapsychological phenomenon. I think you look at that sort of thing and, and you're saying to yourself, and young gener a young generation of scholars such as yourself are saying, something's wrong here. Yes. Yes, and that, that is what, you know, what one would call ideology. To make a blanket statement that there is no evidence in parapsychology, it's an ideological statement, um, that, you know, goes to show either lazy thinking, um, you know, lack of conceptual rigor, you know, just it, um, you know, it's really unfortunate that, you know, in the field of psychology, you know, that, that I'm a part of, um, that, you know, a, a scholar would make such a statement. And I think, you know, my training, at least, you know, at uh, West Georgia under Dr. Simmons Moore, who is a, a parapsychologist in a tenure track position here in the United States, you know, I was, it was really hammered into me that, Parapsychologists are very rigorous when it comes to experiments and it w when it comes to statistical analyses. And that's um, because of the kind of historical pounding that they've taken um, from the quote unquote mainstream science. And so, you know, it, it, I, I applaud, you know, experimentalists and parapsychology for being so rigorous. Um, it's not my forte per se, but nonetheless, I think it, um, it has elevated the field, um, in my opinion. And I think that, um, you know, quantitatively, you know, other sectors of psychology should, can and should really look to parapsychology for, you know, aspiring to be that kind of rigor.
Now, the subtitle of your uh, book, The Arts of Subjectivity, really caught my attention. It's uh, a new animism for the post-media era. Um, I think <laughs> I want to unpack that subtitle if, if, if we can. What do you mean by a new animism? What I envision by a new animism, I think, is again, to go back to um, uh, Foucauldian language, is, is a kind of excavation in a ways. Uh, it's never really not been there, but it's a kind of revitalizing of the world in the way that we, we see the world and what would philosophically be called ontology. Right, what exists, what doesn't exist, um, and you know, I think animism historically was used by you know Western anthropologists, your British specifically anthropologists, to pre uh, pejoratively describe tribal um, understandings of the world. It was it was a bad word to use. You know, this this group has an animistic understanding of the way the world works, but you know that uh, in recent uh, decades, uh, researchers like uh, Bruno Latour in science studies, Isabella Stangers um, in, in science studies and in, in sociology, they've really uh, co-opted that word and that worldview back and are taking it back in a lot of ways and saying that we need to, to understand how we are, um, how the world is alive, to say it simply. The world is alive. It is imbued with uh, spirit. Um, and we need to take that seriously. And we, we need to see how that cosmology has certain implications for our university practices and for our, the way, what and the way that we teach students. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, it's my book advocates a much more kind of anthropological understanding uh, parapsychology in terms of that we need to, to see how we're enmeshed in the world with beings that we cannot see. Um, we cannot see certain beings, um, you know, parapsychology would call these beings maybe ghosts or entities. Um, and there's all sorts of different beings that exist in the world that lie outside the purview of what we call materiality. And um, again, you know, uh, fiction, literature gives us all these kinds of figures to help think through a way to deconstruct physicalism. And it's not only that, but it, it's um, much more interesting, I think, than to, to take the position that everything can be reduced down to the material world. I interview many people who tell me with great certainty that they interact with uh, different, let's call them invisible beings of this sort. I try to probe them. You know, how do you know it's real? How do you know it's not a figment of your imagination? Uh, they usually tell me they're just certain and, and they can't always explain why they are certain. But you're suggesting from a phenomenological point of view, that certainty that they have is, is important data in and of itself. That should be the most important part of the data phenomenologically. Yes. And, you know, qual you know, if we employ more qualitative methodologies in parapsychology, we can still be skeptical and being skeptical is important because it implies certain methodological rigor. But nonetheless, you know, we need to take claimants at face value and believe them right off the bat. And even if you want to talk clinically, um, what I mean by that is from like a counseling or, or clinical perspective. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a licensed counselor here in Georgia. And so I have that background a little bit. But we do a, a disservice to clients and to participants in our research when we disbelieve them right away. And I would argue it hurts them uh, cl on a clinical level. And so I think, again, you're right, uh, Jeff. You know, I think phenomenology would say that, you know, we need to believe them right off the bat. And then we can kind of do our analysis. And that's where the kind of, you know, data crunching uh, takes place.
Now, now the other part of uh, the subtitle of your book, you talk about the post-media era. And uh, that threw me uh, through a little bit of a loop initially because, I mean, here we are uh, using a, a video conversation. I, th I would have thought that this is part of the media, but you're suggesting that we're really in a different era now. It's a little bit of a paradox. And, you know, I, I think that um, uh, there's a certain strain of philosophy out there called accelerationism, um, which just means that... Um, we kind of push capitalism to its paroxysm or to its kind of culminative end. And we do it intentionally to try and to, to kind of get over the, the, the hump, so to speak. Um, there, there's a certain sense in which I think I'm playing on that, um, trying to kind of get past this technological obsession. Um, but um, you're right. Uh, you know, nonetheless, we're, we're, and, and this is part of, uh, of my argument in the book, that we're awash in the world with, again, beings that we can't see, but also gadgets and technology. And if we want to talk about AI, you know, maybe computer um, intelligences that are a part of the world that are also at play. And so... You know, it's it's this kind of a liminal space that we're somewhere we haven't kind of gotten there yet, but we're all, we're on the cusp. In one of your papers, you refer to the uh, French psychiatrist uh, Lacan and his analysis. Uh, I, he had a word, a, a French word, uh, I can't remember. It begins with an L. So almost sounds like laconique or something, but it re refers to a kind of, as you called it, a liminal space that where ideas are not necessarily tangible. There's a sort of intangible uh, water in which we're all swimming that we don't recognize. In English, it's just it's uh, la language or the language, right? That oh. um, this kind of primordial soup of signifiers that we're kind of um, awashed in. Um, and I think that, you know, when, you know, Lacan would argue that, that when we're, we are born, um, he, you know, he has this argument that the, the signifier or the word, um, castrates us or cuts us. And, uh, you know, I'm, of course, I'm critical of the kind of, um, uh, and androcentric, um, approach that he has in terms of privileging maybe certain metaphors over others. But nonetheless, I think the point for Lacan is, is that language arbitrates the world. And so I think that we haven't spent enough time um, as maybe parapsychologists even, um, or in a broader sense, um, certain literary criticism, literary theory has contributed ample uh, literature to this. But I think we need to look at the way that language um, helps shape our identity and helps shape our subjectivity. Um, and so I think, you know, Lacan really does a really good job of that. Um, and I think that um, perhaps, you know, as parapsychologists, um, I have argued in that same paper that you were referencing, Jeff, is that we could perhaps look to psychoanalysis. Um, and other parapsychologists have done this. Uh, look to psychoanalysis for um, inspiration or... Um, perhaps is a, a, maybe a friendly adjacent discipline um, that we can kind of um, tarry with in some ways. You're really looking at a, a constellation of thinkers that have uh, sort of come up in the uh, 20th century, uh, the phenomenologists, uh, the, the psychoanalysts. I think you also refer to the post structuralists uh, uh, who I assume are more or less aligned with the postmodernists uh, as well. And all of these movements are in effect uh, critiquing the world that we have inherited. There is a, I suppose, an undercurrent uh, maybe started with uh, thinkers like Nietzsche um, Husserl, Heidegger, and this kind of undercurrent that um, is circulating among certain thinkers and that is very, very skeptical about um, specific values that we have inherited, not only from the Enlightenment, but all the way going back to the ancient Greeks 
um, if you want to erect a kind of false origin story for Western philosophy, um, which to his um, detriment, I would suggest Heidegger tries to do such a thing. Um, and I think, you know, the truth is it's, it's much more messy. And I think there's cross-fertilization between different cultures. There's not this neat heritage um, that we can kind of trace uh, through the thinking um, in the West. And certainly, you know, the post-structuralists that you mentioned a little bit earlier would would argue that such um, a project is um, a form of fascism, uh, you know, trying to ground a tradition in a very specific heritage, um, when in reality, again, there's all of this kind of uh, messy entanglement that goes on, and that we, you know, if we're not doing um, effortful and energetic scholarship, we're going to miss all of this cross-fertilization. It strikes me, Jacob, that there, there's even a sense when you talk about a, a new animism, an effort to, you know, reframe anthropological thinking about primitive cultures. It's not so different in, in a way than uh, what you get out of the, um, what is now called the um, LBGQ T movement, uh, where people are taking a word like queer, uh, which used to be an insult, and 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 they're raising it to a uh, a point of pride. I'm proud to be queer. Certainly, uh, you know Judith Butler famously, I think in 1993, had an essay uh, come out that argued for uh, the reclaiming of certain pejorative words that were used against that community. Um, and kind of taking them back and appropriating them as our own. Um, and I think, um, you know, I, you know, there's nuances to be discussed in terms of playing identity politics. And what I mean by that is, you know, positioning oneself as, as inferior to the other in order to gain a certain upper hand. But I think, you know, that's a whole separate discussion. But I think your point, Jeff, I think is, is really well taken in that I think, um, what I have argued in parapsychology is that we need to reclaim the subversiveness of psi. And we need to reclaim that it is challenging to mainstream science rather than trying to be mainstream ourselves. And so I think there's a, there's a real um, opportunity for parapsychology to be that next paradigm, to shift the paradigm in mainstream science because necessarily psi or paranormality is subversive to the normative scientific way of doing things. Um, and so there's certainly a parallel to be made between those two. It, it seems to me that uh, in human development in general, or particularly amongst teenagers, there's there's always a drive to fit in, to be considered accepted and normal uh, um, amongst one's peers. And at the same time, that that drive can be very damaging to the to the spirit that uh, for people to preserve this sense of of being weird, which uh, I think at one time meant magical. Uh, is something we need to maintain. It strikes me that one of the things that parapsychologists have really been afraid of is is being considered magicians, and yet that that may be ultimately what all of this is telling us that the the power of the human mind is the power to work magic. Yes, and you know, parapsychology is not alone in that, and. Uh, you know, Freud famously tried to make psychoanalysis a scientific discipline. And that, you know, there's been certain rebellion in the discipline since then. And so, you know, I hope that we as parapsychologists can institute our own kind of rebellion and take back uh, the magic that I feel like, as you suggest, we may have lost along the way, you know, trying to fit in uh, with, with the, the mainstream. Well, Jacob Glazer, this has been a delightful conversation. I think that the uh, scholarship you're doing is very rigorous and incisive. I encourage our viewers to uh, take a look at your books and, and, and your papers. I expect great things from you in, in the future. You have a long uh, and I would say probably glorious career ahead of you. Uh, and I look forward to future conversations.
Thank you, Jeffrey. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with me. And for those of you watching, thank you for being with us. Thank you.